All right, good afternoon. Welcome to VMworld. I hope everyone enjoyed the keynote this morning. And I especially enjoyed watching Yan Bing on the stage, especially her last words, go virtual SAN. And that's going to be the topic of this session. We're going to talk about hyper-converging uh, hyper infrastructure, and we are going to talk about virtual SAN. So before going to the presentation, there are some disclaimers you can read. And we're going to start from the storage industry. Um, as you know, the storage industry is going through a major transformation. There are a number of tectonic shifts that are happening in the industry. Uh, let's start from the right-hand side, um, commodity hardware. This started actually from the internet data centers. If you go into whether Google or Facebook data center, you will see the hardware are surprisingly uniform. It's all x86 CPUs, and they're using the same hardware to, to, to providing compute, storage, and networking functions. And over the last few years, uh, through software-defined data center, we are bringing this model of consuming key functionalities of data center through software on a single layer of commodity hardware uh, from VMware. And we want to package it in an easy to consume software defined data center solutions. And that is clearly helping to redefining the storage market. Now in the middle is the flash technologies. It's redefining the physics of storage media with three orders of magnitude of uh, uh, faster latency and two order of magnitude of uh, uh, larger bandwidth. And that is redefining how storage software should be written to accommodate the media that's underneath. And we recently are uh, hearing the new exciting announcement from Intel and Micron about yet another generation of the new solid state storage that's clearly going to uh, shift the storage industry from the bottom up. And last but not least is a shifting application. Um, as you have heard this morning from Ray and Kit, there are clearly an emergence of new uh, cloud native application models. And that combined with the virtualization that's already taking place is requiring the infrastructure, including storage, really to be managed from an application-centric point of view rather than the other way around. All these trends come together to bring forth a new architecture that is hyper-converged. So what's hyper-converged infrastructure? It is a convergence between compute, storage, and networking functionalities into a single software architecture, and often running on a single pool of hardware. And they operate on standard x86 CPUs, and they take advantage of the disks, whether it's magnetic hard drives or flash solid state drives directly attached to the servers, rather than uh, from a separate storage subsystem. And through software, uh, through a layer of distributed software, they can pull together these directly attached SSDs and HDDs and turn them into enterprise-grade storage in the same way that they are being delivered from shared storage today. And as a result, they essentially deliver you the uh, powerful software-defined commodity economics. Uh, they can maximize the performance given the flash now is sitting closer to the CPU, so you can fully enjoy the low latencies the new storage media provides, and it provides the parallel I.O. through a distributed architecture, so it really delivers unparalleled performance, and it can uh, bring together a converged management plan to allow the storage to be provisioned really from the needs of the applications from a VM-centric uh, point of view. So this coming together is hyper-converged infrastructure, or HCI, as some call it. Now, HCI, turned out, has a great relationship to SDDC. Now, VMware had been working on SDDC over the last few years, and some customers have started on this journey, while others might be having a little difficult time to figure out where to start. It turns out hyper-converged infrastructure is a great place to start. It essentially give a, a simplest form factor to allow the compute, the storage, and networking all come together in software and start being deployed in a data center. And as a composed to traditional infrastructure, it is uh, simpler. 
It often gives you lower cost. It is a more scalable architecture, and it delivers the highest performance. And that's just a technology part of it. Now, when we look at dollars, the transformation is astounding. This is a, a result from IDC, um, an uh, analyst all of you know well, and showing the uh, dramatic transformation of the storage market, in this case, the mid market, in the next three years. Uh, HCI, as you see, is the highest growth part of the mid market storage, growing from $300 million in 2014 to $2.5 billion in 2018. And that's an annual growth rate of 68%. And where did the dollar come from? Of course, the market is growing, but the traditional architecture is actually shrinking in an equally dramatic pace. Uh, the traditional storage is going to go from $6.1 billion in 2014 to just $1.8 billion in three years. So that is a quite dramatic change um, in the landscape of storage. And so hyperconverged is happening, and it's happening fast. Um, and from VMware point of view, we are certainly not the only vendor who delivers a hyperconverged solution. But we believe we provide the best architecture to deliver it. And our architecture starts from vSphere and vSAN. These are our core hypervisor software and our hyperconverged software defined storage stack. And they come together actually in a single binary as we deliver uh, to our customers. And so let me go into virtual SAN. How many of you have heard of virtual SAN? Great. How many of you have deployed virtual SAN? Great. So I see actually quite a lot, 40, 50 customers here already deploy virtual SAN. It's a pretty new product, but they actually get amazing customer traction. We're very encouraged and moved by the speed the customer is coming to this new model. Now, virtual SAN, as some of you or most of you are familiar with, is a uh, distributed software that's optimized for vSphere VMs. It's fully integrated with vSphere from both control path and data path perspective. It's very scalable, scalable to any scale that vSphere can scale to. And it can be managed from our storage policy-based management. Based on the automation policies the user define, it can be automatically provisioned and managed. And it offers the unparalleled, the best performance for a vSphere environment and offers the most flexibility in terms of the hardware it can support. And talking about uh, the flexibility on hardware, there are many ways a virtual SAM product can be deployed. First, it's a software-based solution. And each and every customer have their own favorite hardware server platform. So we have a hardware compatibility list, which offers a ready node from almost every leading server vendors. So no matter whether you are uh, like HP, or Dell, or Lenovo, or Cisco, or Supermicro, that you will, be fine, you will be able to find a ready node configuration that vSAN has been fully tested and certified. And you can buy those hardware and deploy vSphere plus vSAN software on those hardware. And that's what's on the top. You can consume it by installing software on the hardware. Now, for the customer who demand even higher level of simplicity, and that's where Evo Rail comes in. And this is a fully integrated appliance that we're working with our QEP qualified uh, server partners uh, to deliver together. So it's an integrated hardware plus software, and you can uh, buy and getting support from just a single company. So from, from a customer perspective, you can enjoy the flexibility of the software while also have the option to buy it as an appliance and achieve the ultimate simplicity. So by consuming vSphere vSAN and having that delivering both the compute and storage capability for your data center, there are a number of benefits you can achieve from this. Start. Uh, it's integration, the fully integrating between the uh, compute and storage stack. In fact, vSphere plus vSAN is the only hyperconverged solution with a single pane of glass 
for you to manage both your compute infrastructure and your storage infrastructure. It gives you the ultimate simplicity and a reduced cost. And on average, our customer saves 50%, half of their capex cost. And they save additional cost through the day-to-day -day operations. It delivers really, really high performance. Um, in fact, for those of you who will stop by the expo floor, you should stop by the HTI zone, and you'll be surprised by the performance of the 64-node all-flash cluster that Intel sponsored over there. And there are millions of IOPS that can be delivered from just a single cluster of vSphere and vSAN. And in terms of scale, not only the size it can scale to, but it can dynamically scale up and down. You can add nodes to your cluster when you need more capacity. You can also add disk to each node when you need more capacity and can shrink the size of the cluster when you no longer need so much capacity. So it's a dynamic elasticity in terms of the ability to scale up and down. And as I mentioned, it gives you the most wide uh, choice of hardware uh, that really gives the flexibility as well as the cost benefit uh, that you can choose. Since uh, we shipped vSAN 1.0 last uh, March, so 18 months ago, uh, we shipped the second version uh, March of this year, and we will be announcing the third version in a few slides. And just in a short 18 months, we closed over 2,000 customers, and we have data showing at least 2,000 actually have deployed our solution in their data center. And these are just some examples of these customers and the benefits as shown up in their quotes uh, of their, experiencing, uh, their experience using uh, vSAN. Uh, it's rock solid, it's mature. It actually, we, we haven't experienced a real data loss scenarios in our customers, even though it's been widely deployed. And it really did work as advertised. Now one thing that VMware are very proud of is our software just works. And our software is more reliable than the hardware. And I think that's, again, exemplified in Virtual Sand, a new product actually de uh, developed from the ground uh, starting five years ago. So a lot of uh, blood and sweat have gone into this product, and our engineers are very proud of the quality they have delivered in this product. Um, now, here's more numbers uh, to support the statement I made earlier. In terms of cost, here shows a comparison with both a traditional array as well as with another HCI solution uh, that actually has a lot of mind share among our customers. As you see, through consuming virtual SAN as a software plus hardware solution, that you save about half of the cost comparing bo with both a traditional storage architecture and the alternative HCI solutions. And if you want to know more details, we actually have uh, blogs that have been published that dives into these numbers uh, to give you uh, like dollar to dollar detail to show these are apple to apple comparisons of the cost. And now we are at half the cost. Now how about performance? Uh, there are various uh, HCI solutions on the market today. And storagereview.com actually recently did some performance benchmarks using VMMark, which is a popular and trusted uh, third-party benchmark software. And vSAN actually passed with flying colors. It delivers the highest performance of any solutions that was tested, that it, it completed 18 tiles, where each tile is a workload unit uh, without a problem, where the other HCI solutions could not complete 10 tiles. So we are at least at 80% performance advantage with this kind of application workload and with other numbers, the difference, with other benchmarks, the difference could be even bigger. Uh, so essentially, you are looking at spending half the cost and getting almost double the performance from this solution versus the alternative HCI solutions. Um, now, what are the use cases of vSAN? What do people use it for? And we actually went through uh, uh, several phases of uh, uh, vSAN deployment. With version one, it's the uh, VDI and robo and test dev cases that we advertise to the customers. Now, many customers started with VDI. 
which has uh, clear storage problems with both cost and performance that vSAN squarely addresses. So customers love it for uh, VDI use cases. Now, ask other customers deploy it for robo use cases for their branch offices, and sometimes they call micro data centers or server rooms, and some people deploy it for test dev. Now, to our surprises, even with version one, a number of customers start deploying vSAN for real tier one production uh, uh, application. They were surprised by the uh, performance and the robustness of the product. With version two in Q1, now we officially stated that we encourage and support our customers to go fully to all their data center production applications, including mission critical applications. And since then, our customers have embraced this concept at a faster pace. As you can see here, this is a recent customer survey that we have received last month. We picked uh, randomly some of our customers and sent out their surveys to find out what are they using their uh, vSAN solutions for. And we got 58 uh, replies from the samples that we, we sent out. The business critical apps is actually the number one use case among our customers with about 62% of our customers using this use case. And of course, the other application use cases are also being used. And if you see the total is above 100% because many customers are using vSAN for more than one use cases. They are using it both for data center production apps and maybe also for VDI and maybe also for their robo applications. And that's why you see the, uh, the total is more than the 58 uh, customers who uh, returned their survey. So it is actually my pleasure to invite Mike uh, to join me uh, on the stage because those are just surveys and data. And what better to learn how real customers are using vSAN you know, than talking to a real customer. So welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. So please take a seat. So Mike is a, uh, is a CEO of uh, Vertitech IT and also CTO of a couple strong, uh, you know, important health uh, uh, system providers. Mm -hmm. Maybe, Mike, you can introduce uh, to the audience more about yourself sure. and the companies that you work sure. for. Uh, Vertitech provides, uh, essentially, I'm a rent-a-CTO. <laughs> I work for a number of healthcare institutions, and that is the primary focus of our, of our organization. Um, and uh, I'm often called in, and our folks are often called in to help these organizations implement exactly what we're talking about here, a hyper-converged architecture and centered often on uh, virtual SANS. Um, we provide everything from uh, the design services. Interesting enough, we sell nothing. Uh, we're not uh, a partner of VMware in the traditional sense, but we work in concert. Um, we advise our clients. We help them uh, install it. We help them support it. We also help them with the rationalization and, more importantly, going back when these things are done and proving that we got what we paid for. All right. Sounds impressive. Now, the slides show some uh, interesting stats about these two companies. So they are pretty sizable mm -hmm. uh, institutions here. Absolutely, absolutely. And with multiple data centers. So uh, what's your perspective of hyper-converged? I, I think it's, uh, hyper-convergence is, uh, is not really even an option. It's a must. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are in the healthcare world, but uh, in the healthcare world, budgets are flat. And due to the ever increasing complexity of healthcare, the government demands of records, securities, all these things, um, uh, the need to do more with less is just unavoidable, and uh, we are not going to be given more money. So in order to increase our storage, increase our performance, we have to do it within existing budgets, which really means we have to do it with something other than these silos and expensive technologies. Hyperconvergence is really, from a financial point of view, an absolute must. Great. So when did you start looking at hyperconverged, and when did you uh, start looking at vSAN? Well, I would say we were hoping for hyperconverged well before we were looking for it because the cost of storage from EMC, from other vendors, is, is, is significant. Um, we began about two years ago to review uh, hyperconvergence as it developed both with VMware and, and other, other firms. Um, when uh, vSAN was first introduced, we uh, saw some amazing advantages. Um, if I can say one of the things that uh, caught our attention was that this was a product where the storage was built into the abstraction itself, 
rather than a layered on approach which uh, competitors often use. That got our attention. Uh, so we started a point of uh, really a, a, a testing phase at both of these institutions. Primarily Lancaster General, um, we're using uh, uh, vSAN to really replace all of our SANs. So this is a multi-year project, about two years in the works. Right. And how far down the road are you today? Um, in different institutions at different levels. In the case of Lancaster General, um, uh, much of the older storage, and we're talking here maybe three, two, three hundred terabytes of, uh, I'm going to call it general access storage, has now been replaced by vSAN. Ultimately, um, with the exception of some of our uh, EMR requirements, which will take a little longer, all of it will be replaced. Um, at Base State, which is much more of a full hyperconvergence, of which vSAN is a part of it, we're just beginning to migrate all of our applications now. So my gut is that both of these institutions will be essentially on vSAN fully, with very little exceptions within the next 24 months. Mm -hmm. And what's the experience so far? Do you feel that you are getting what you paid for? Is it working as advertised? Absolutely. There, there are some rough points. Um, installing this level of, of uh, integrated software really means that all your hardware has to, uh, it may be on the, on the VMware acceptable hardware list, but you have to make sure your drivers are correct, your versions are correct. There's a lot of integrative functions in deploying this technology, but VMware has been excellent. Uh, the level of su support your organization has given our clients is you know, without, without equal. We've had very little trouble. And what's its impact on the budget? Uh, Enormous. Um, I can certainly uh, tell you that from the Lancaster side, uh, the cost of replacement uh, is less than half wow. when you're all said and done. Um, we expect similar numbers uh, from Bay State. Um, more importantly, the OPEX side of this is, is, is significant. Uh, in the traditional environment where you have vendors like EMC or NetApp or IBM, they supply uh, rather expensive software uh, and hardware maintenance contracts. Because the uh, vSAN is part of a larger uh, integrated system, the smart nets and other service agreements for the hardware, plus the relatively lower cost of the software, are maybe 10 to 20 percent less year over year uh, in terms of standard separate siloed costs. So at least that, that savings. That, that's great to hear. And we certainly had it on our drawing board. It's great to hear it's working out in reality. Yes. Now, besides storage, are there other parts of SDDC that you are looking at? Absolutely. Both of those Absolutely. environments? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, would, I would point to the network piece of the whole affair. Um, in the case of Base State, um, we are a three data center uh, dark fiber based network where we're really active, active, active. The concept was to say that no matter what happens, stuff would just remain on at all times. Um, to do that, uh, although vSAN has the ability in itself to uh, essentially, if you will, write data concurrently in multiple places, you still need rock solid networking and in interconnectivity to do this. So NSX is another product that we've, uh, we've pulled into this. If you really want, uh, the, I would say, the picture, Charles, of, of, yeah. um, of uh, hyperconvergence, it really is from the VMware point of view, vSphere, NSX, and vSAN. When those three products are con uh, combined, yeah. you essentially have a fully uh, converged system. Yeah, it clearly compute networking storage are yeah, just the, the three legs of the stew. That's the data center. Absolutely. And in fact, to support multi-data multi center capabilities, a good integration that vSAN has with NSX is a key. Without uh, a doubt. Right. And now, looking to the future, you know, anything you hope to see from VMware, both in vSAN and in, in the other areas of the SDDC? Absolutely. I'll, I'll focus on vSAN because obviously that's a topic here. Um, we would love vSAN to have more activity outside of its cluster. There are some older technologies that simply do not operate in a uh, vSphere environment. So as the abilities of this data to be available to external systems, which as I understand is something that hopefully is in the works, that will be a big, uh, a big hit for us. That's cool. So uh, talking about future, why don't you stay here with me as I uh, share some of the future, uh, what's coming up in vSAN. Will you give me the price? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And Michael, join me in presenting the future to you. Sure. So, so first of all, up is v Virtual SAN 6.1. This is the third version of vSAN that we're introducing to our customer base at this event at VMworld. And it's going to ship next month. And uh, it's going to deliver the enterprise level high availability, as well as a much simplified management, including monitoring and troubleshooting. And of course, it's going to deliver even higher performance uh, to our customers. And I'll go into a little details a little bit later. 
and equally important, as you hear in the uh, uh, main stage this morning, we are announcing EVO SDDC. And this goes beyond hyperconvergence. Really, having hyperconvergence as a key building, uh, building block and extending that to managing the entire SDDC inclusive of NSX and networking. Uh, so that sort of uh, fits exactly what you were oh, talking about. Absolutely. If I can make a comment on that, um, we're kind of waiting for that. Um, one of the things that all of the institutions that we're instituting this, and, and the two we mentioned here are, are just some of them, um, the control uh, management and the automation of all of the bits and pieces that make this work is essential. Um, it's great to, uh, uh, to um, compress and, and, and set everything into one platform, but the problem is, in theory, error and trouble can propagate at lightning speed through it. Yeah. So having the control uh, and the ability to see and operate it and automate parts of it is, is essential. And right now, um, uh, that is a part that we're waiting for. That is something that uh, we need. That's great. Um, and now going into a little bit more detail on 6.1, uh, there are three pillars in the new features it's delivering. The first pillar is enterprise availability and data protection. In, in particular, we are introducing the stretched clustering capability that does synchronous replication across sites with a zero RPO. So this allows you to have a failure in one data center and still have the data fully available from the other data center. We also improved our asynchronous replication capabilities by decreasing the RPO from 15 minutes to five minutes for our vSphere replication product. We will fully support SMPFT uh, that allows you to have basic application level high availability without losing a beat. And we're going to support Oracle Rack and Microsoft clusters. That's essential. Uh, at Bay State, for example, um, we are both an Oracle and Microsoft shop, and we are uh, instituting. We are, uh, for those of you in the medical side of things, we are a Cerner uh, facility, and uh, we are based on Oracle. And the implementation of Rack and exactly what you're saying are really the last pieces in our uptime guarantee to our institution. Yes. Yeah. And the second pillar is actually exactly addressing some of the challenges uh, that we had with the earlier versions. As, I'm, as Mike mentioned, you know, having installing software on hardware sometimes cannot, is not as simple as we would like it to be. And there are a lot of room for improvement with early versions, how we can better detect and monitor and manage the underlying hardware as well as the operation of our software. And that's where we made uh, big improvements, both from our own management system, managed through vCenter, as well as with a plug-in to vRealize operations. Now you can go through a single pane of glass, manage your entire data center, inclusive of storage and particular vSAN uh, that you have deployed. Absolutely. And then we added new hardware options, you know, supporting two node cluster for robo use cases with a remote VM that serve as a witness. So this allow minimize the hardware investment the customer needs to make at each of the remote sites. And we're also announcing support for NVMe storage, as well as the ultra dim, where you can plug the flash directly into the memory slots. And there are increasing number of customers, or partners are delivering that to our customers. Excellent. And now go to the EVO SDDC. As you can see, HCI today is mostly focused on the compute and storage convergence, where with either virtual SAN or EVO rail, you are seeing the convergence uh, in those two layers. SDDC goes one step beyond that to look at the entire data center, inclusive of networking and cloud automation. And that, as Mike mentioned earlier, that glue layer, the management layer, really simplifies the customer's OPEX when they are looking at, at their entire data center. Now, if you're interested uh, in vSAN, and if you haven't uh, bought or deployed vSAN, there are three ways that you can give it a try. The first way is hands-on lab. You know, there are hands-on lab uh, right here, and if you have a free minute, you can go there to try out vSAN. Uh, there's a free download that you can download vSAN into your own environment and give it a spin yourself. And then we are introducing a new tool we call vSAN assessment. This is helping both our customers as well as our resellers and partners for their customers you can install this tool in your data center and have it run in one week, and it can collect all the statistics to tell you what, whether you are a good candidate to deploy vSAN, as well as the exact configuration that your vSAN should be configured with. 
So it can really simplify the process, the decision process for our customers, whether vSAN is a fit for their environments. And on the right-hand side, there are additional resources that are available, our data sheet, our blogs. Uh, you can certainly visit our new virtual blogs uh, blog site, which is a brand new site. You can find all the information you need to find over there. Just don't make a tool that makes me unnecessary. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm concerned about. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Now, looking further, in addition to 6.1, which we are shipping this quarter, we are also announcing a beta version of the follow-on uh, version of vSAN that's going to ship in Q4 next quarter. And the key feature that's going to be introduced is uh, data efficiency. In particular, uh, we are introducing erasure coding. Uh, today, vSAN is fully replicated, meaning if you want to have uh, uh, FTT photo tolerate equal to one, you need to have two copies of data. If your FTT equal to two, you need three copies of data. With erasure coding, it can reduce the amount of space you need to tolerate one or two or n number of failures. So it can save you 50, 100, or even more percentage of the space. Let me make a note on this. This actually, when we learned that this was one of your elements on the roadmap, it was uh, essential to us. Mm -hmm. In the healthcare world, um, imaging, uh, x-rays, all these kind of things, uh, are enormous size uh, pieces of data. But more importantly, you have to retain them for virtually ever. Uh, and if we were to look at what causes our data to grow the most, it is uh, a good chunk of the imaging issue. And having to keep it uh, available at all times in multiple data centers is an enormous cost. Um, vSAN already is saving our cost because of the efficiency of how it works, and I don't need quite the levels of duplication and secondary systems that I do in a traditional design. But when this comes out, what we've uh, sold, if you will, to our upper management is the fact that here's a product that will continually create tools and uh, systems within itself to limit the amount of data, yet still retain the high availability. So this is essential to us. Yes, and this is a feature many customers are asking for. Now, of course, there's a trade-off where erasure coding, it might use a little bit of more CPU resources, but you do get a saving on the storage front. Now, the second space efficiency feature is deduplication. Now, I'm sure all of you are familiar with that feature, uh, and depending on the workload, it can give you from 1 to 1.5x to 8x of space uh, savings. If you combine two of them together, you can save you know, from 1.5 to 16 times of storage in terms of how much disks you need for the capacity you require for your applications. And to, to, to give another interesting point, although it's not mentioned of the institutions you, you've mentioned that we support, uh, we have a, a couple of um, medical facilities uh, that are uh, research uh, and university-based. And uh, one of them in particular, through um, genetics and, and other things that they have, they have petabytes of uh, information. And they have multiple, for those of you who are EMC folks, they have multiple uh, VMAXs fully, fully loaded out. Um, the that is astounding. Uh, it's, it's probably more than our entire IT budget. Um, in the case of this product, those are particularly what we're looking for because a lot of that can be deduplicated. So these are, these are the two features that I think, separate from what we've talked about earlier, are uh, what we're looking for. Those basically st stretch a dollar even longer. Absolutely. And we are also introducing the checksum feature, which is additional protection layer against the data uh, integrity issues. Now, whether it's a software bug, whether the bit rot uh, situations, uh, checksum can detect the situation and alert the, uh, the customers and can prevent data integrity issues or data corruption from happening. So that's another enterprise feature that we'll, we'll be introducing in this next version. Now, beta is now open for registration. So for those of you who would like to try this new version out, you can go sign up uh, at that particular website, vmware.com, go vSAN beta, and we will select uh, some of the uh, customers who signed up to be our beta customers and give us feedback on these important features. Now, um, look even further beyond Q4. In fact, let's go a little further into the next 10 years. The future will look very different. This is a um, report from Wikibon, another analyst, uh, showing predicting the storage market over the next 10 years. Today, it's dominated by traditional storage architecture, over 90%. Now, in 10 years, that will become less than 10% of the storage market, where the rest of storage will be server-based. They're either hyper-converged, which is more the blue 
portion or kind of served from the cloud. So you will see from VMware that will continue to embark on the blue to deliver the best hyperconverged storage that you can deploy for your environment, as well as you will see capability from us to better integrate between the blue and the green and the red so that this entire mixture of architecture can work seamlessly together from your on-prem data centers to the cloud. One of the things that um, is interesting there is when we selected um, uh, VMware's complete product stack, one of the elements was, uh, although we have three data centers in the case of Bay State and uh, two in the case of Lancaster, um, on the Bay State side, with three data centers, we're almost in a data center N plus one condition. So uh, secondary complex storage uh, for backup purposes really isn't needed. vSAN takes that. But what do you do when we're a hospital and we're, all of our data centers are within 10 miles of each other? How do you handle a, an issue about regional trouble? So it was always assumed, and as so far proven correct, that our cloud strategy is a direct, or public cloud strategy, is a direct outcome of hyperconvergence. So we intend to basically use what would now be considered a static off-site relationship with firms like SunGuard and move them into uh, literally our fourth cloud data center and move in and out of it dynamically. So yep. absolutely true. Yeah, we're definitely looking at a unified hybrid cloud world. Uh, as we look into the future, and hyperconverged is inevitable. Uh, the world is moving with or without us, and the best we can do is to be a catalyst of this change and be on the right side of this historic curve. So, before we go into the Q&A section, this is another advertisement for us and our partner Intel in the HCI zone. We have a 64 node, a real working system, in the Expo HCI zone area, that's two racks of all flash uh, uh, Intel servers running vSAN. 64 nodes, 6,400 virtual machines running on those nodes, delivering real time 4.2 million IOPS, serving half a petabyte of storage. So that's a real system you are looking at. And it's very hard to actually replicate a traditional storage system that can deliver that level of performance from, from a two racks of a form factor. Now I know why our uh, vendors aren't delivering our flash drives fast enough. You sucked them all down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. So uh, now let's uh, uh, move to our Q&A section. There are two microphones in the uh, aisles uh, on either side. If you have questions, please come to the microphone. And Mike and I here will be here to answer your questions. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Do you see any use cases where vSAN is being used for unstructured data as well? Ah, uh, very good question. Um, and for us, that is uh, some of our business logic and our analysis tools. Um, not in our case, not yet. Um, there are, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Charles, there are, yeah, there yeah. are directions uh, in the product yeah, line yeah. for this. But for us, no, it, that, that we're not using it at these institutions. And, and it does depend from customer to customer. Mm -hmm. So we do have a number of customers who are actually using vSAN for big data use cases already, running HDFS actually on top of virtual SAN and uh, running Hadoop. You know? So if you call Hadoop uh, unstructured data, so we do have customers deploying that. Right. Now, we do not introduce a file service ourselves yet, but we do have partners like Nexenta and uh, SoftNAS who deliver a file service layer on top of vSAN. So for those who are looking at file storage through our partnership, you can also use vSAN for them. And that's what we're uh, going to end up doing. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, question, how are you encrypting data with vSAN? So today we have a hardware a partnership solution. Um, there is a, uh, a partner called High Trust, and we have a solution uh, uh, reference architecture uh, published. How you can use vSAN in conjunction with High Trust to deliver encryption. We, you know, we also support the self-encrypted drives. Yeah. High Trust uh, is a software solution, not hardware. That's a good point. So, so, so we are working with High Trust with a partnership solutions there. Now we do support self-encrypting drives uh, that will offer another alternative in delivering encryption to the uh, and, customers. And what's the cost impact of self-encrypted drive on your cost model? Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't hear. Can you close and your microphone? What is the impact of self-encrypted drive on your proposed cost model? 
uh, impact of uh, SED with, uh, I missed the last two words. What is, what is the impact of a self-encrypting drive versus one that's not in performance? I assume that's in, what you're asking. No, on cost. Oh, in the cost. In the cost. Yeah. Uh, so we do need to look that up. So I assume SEDs will be higher cost than uh, non-encrypted drives. But, like uh, twice? And, and, and that's a good question. And by the way, we do have it on our roadmap uh, without a schedule, but it, it, that you, you should expect to see that feature um, in the future. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question for you around uh, your Amor Cerner and your mm -hmm. other shop. Are they going to bless uh, using <laughs> virtual SANS? Are you guys uh, using uh, Linux or Red Hat for as the OS? That's a great question. And uh, I'm going to include Epic in the usual gang of suspects because uh, one of those institutions is Epic, the other one is Cerner, and they're exactly in the same position. Um, both Epic and Cerner are themselves experimenting with this technology within their own facilities. So there is, let's just say that it's very hard to look at one's customer base and say, um, no, you can't do it. So what we're doing uh, through uh, the hospitals that we support is we're working closely with both of those, both of those vendors, engineers, and um, kind of angling to become what is, I would say, their reference design. The answer is yes, they're going to have to support it. In both of these institutions, especially Bay State, we're migrating there from an AIX um, IBM SVC architecture onto x86 UCS and vSAN. They don't like it, but they have not stopped us because it is an inevitable function. Yeah. So you actually have them backing from them. Oh that's, yeah. That's one of the things that we have. We're a Cerner shop as well and trying to get them to bend to do anything is very difficult to say the least. It's not easy, but we've, I mean, feel free to, to reach out to me. I'd be happy to share some of the contacts and some of the um, conversations underway. The more that we uh, communicate with them uh, through different health systems, um, the more likely, and it's not even more likely, the faster they are, are to capitulate. But the end result is uh, I would be surprised within two years. I assume you're at um, 2015? Mm -hmm. Is that where you are? Okay. Um, we've made the 2015 upgrade at Bay State uh, concomitant with the vSAN uh, x86 architecture and basically held our guns. And they've, uh, there's going to have to be some SLA negotiations between sure. us and them, but both our, our management and their management are kind of aware of this. And my gut is that we're going to end up being kind of the, the test case for this. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Uh, what's the difference between uh, Evo SDTC and Evo Rack and Rail? I'm just kind of sure. confused. With sure. So Evo SDTC uh, replaces Evo Rack. So it's sort of a new name for Evo Rack. When we did a preview last year, Evo Rack was a code name. And now e Evo SDTC is a real name. Now, it's, it doesn't replace Evo Rail because Evo Rail is a more focused solution, uh, you know, of, of HCI appliance converge vSphere and vSAN with the EVO manager together, where EVO SDDC is a broader product for the whole data center. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Nobody else? Guys, you've got to ask questions. Mm -hmm. this is more, for the, more for the vendor. Um, on the uh, vVol side, any futures for vVols? Yes, we do. So we have uh, a second version of Evolve planned for next year, and there are Evolve sessions at VMworld where they will dive more into more details, both in terms of our current Evolve adoption by the Evolve partners, as well as uh, what's coming up. In fact, you will see more data protection and more performance and more other service level agreement being supported by our future virtual vol volume offerings. Uh, something that might be uh, satisfied in version 6.1 or what you're talking about, but trying to get data between clusters, um, I've, I've seen that as an issue, so I'm not sure, you know, right. trying to get, uh, you know, having this limited to a VM cluster, you know, right. seeing so, migration technologies. Today. So today, that is a configuration that we do not support yet. Uh, so today, uh, the concept of virtual SAN, it's really a native storage to a vSphere cluster. So we focus on make it extremely simple to use. So just one button click, you turn on a storage feature of your vSphere product. And by constraining storage as a property of the cluster, it gives you the simplest management model. And now that being said, we did hear from both of you now the, the 
desire to have the storage being exposed potentially to workload outside of the same cluster, and that is certainly something we are looking at uh, today. Yeah, I, I, can, I can maybe add to that a little I, bit. Um, in, in fact, let me introduce you first. So this is uh, Christian Dickman, and he is actually a tech, tech lead, which at VMware is the most honorable title you can give <laughs> to a person. He basically is a lead engineer for virtual Uh So two answers to your question. You know, on the one hand, if you talk about VMs, actually you have perfect connectivity because you know VMs can move uh, just fine with virtual SAN across clusters. You don't have any mobility constraints. Uh, storage motion, X motion will take care of those kind of things. Um, so that's the first part. When it comes to VMs, you know the virtual SAN is accessible from your entire data center in that regard. If you're asking, can we use it from? You know, you, you still have a physical box, and you would like to uh, have it have that consumed. So not really two clusters consuming it, but some external storage, con um, some external physical host trying to consume it. Those kind of use cases are definitely something that we are looking into. We, we want to make sure that all your use cases, and if you go to the future session that Christos is going to host uh, here at VMworld, you will hear about all kinds of different consumption models that we're thinking about how the storage that we provide is not just for VMs, but for all kinds of different consumption models in VMs or outside of VMs. Uh, so, so, you know, check out that session. There's also a blog that was posted yesterday specifically on futures, and that includes these consumption models. Thanks, Christian. Uh, in fact, there are quite a few other sessions. You know, I think Christian will have some deeper dives of vSAN sessions, and Christos, who's our CTO, have a future of vSAN uh, of software defined story sessions, and I highly encourage you to uh, participate in those. Can I, sessions. can I also suggest that um, one of the uh, lead architects at Bay State, um, I don't know if he's in the room or not, um, but is doing a uh, sort of geekier, techier session on Thursday about the actual uh, three data center design, which encompasses NSX, vSAN, uh, VCLAD, everything. Um, any of you who want to know more about that, I would say attend that because you'll actually see our, our design in detail and can ask questions of the people who built it. Yeah. It's on Thursday. I'm not sure of the time. It is a, um, uh, uh, the gentleman's name is Dave Miller, so if you look him up under speakers, uh, it's his session. I know it's on Thursday. I just don't remember the time or the location. So, two part question. Um, first part is you said you have two different sets of data centers. One is three and one is two. Mm -hmm. So, the issue with two is that if you were to lose a data center, you'd lose half your cluster, which means you'd lose your entire vSAN. So, first part is how do you deal with that in a vSAN implementation currently before the stretched data center is a reality? Sure, sure. Um, in, the, uh, in the case of the organization that has only two data centers, that's for the moment the case. Um, one of the advantages of the just simple compressing of physical size of all the equipment is that in a hospital, for example, which rarely uses public data centers, you know, they just open up a room basically in a building and that's the data center. Um, in the case of this two center site, um, one of the machine rooms in one of the uh, hospital campuses that are part of a do our dark fiber network that we're installing will become the third facility. We feel that in a healthcare environment, you need three data center physical locations. They don't have to be huge rooms with raised floors. They just to be, need to be three complete physical sites where you build all your nodes and are all interconnected, in, in the case of these two institutions, by uh, DWM networks that we own. And the second part is regarding deduplication in 6.1. Um, I assume that deduplication would happen on a per host basis, not across the entire vSAN. Is that correct? Yeah, so let me give you a little detail, then Christian can certainly add more details and keep me honest here. So uh, deduplication is actually at per disk group level, and it is an inline deduplication, a fixed length, and it's happening when we destage in from the caching tier to the persistence tier. So it happens in line, but the granularity is at uh, this group granularity. So then you would gain your efficiency by keeping certain workloads together so, in some so, fashion? So, so in fact, the reason we designed this way is we do not want to break the policy-based management model. And by constraining the uh, domain of the dedupe to a disk group, essentially it's compatible to all our application-centric uh, storage policies. Yeah. 
Uh, just um, another question follow up. Uh, based on the vSAN can be used other than the purpose of the v, uh, VMware perspective. Uh, for example, the Evil Rail, you have a, a 10 terabyte of data that um, being used by the VMs. Can we spin up a server, you know, a Windows uh, DFS server, uh, you know, uh, like a file server, yep. uh, allocate space to it for a low end use? Can that be a possibility or is, is yes. something? Yes. Uh, in fact, anything runs in a VM can use vSAN data storage. So if you like to run a Windows file server um, in a VM on top of vSAN, I don't think there's anything preventing you from doing it. Right. But Christian, anything to add? And in fact, uh, if you look at the Nexenta solution, for example, uh, providing file services, that's really you know, what, what's happening there, right? You, you have a set of VMs that are serving out file services, and uh, you know, that, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I, I don't see any problem with that. Uh, I mean, not really a problem, it just was a it's a recommendation. It, it, it is fully supported. Yeah. Yes. So, so if you want to use it vSAN that way, we will support you. Now, obviously, it's uh, if you were to host VMs, right? V direct vSAN access is the way to go, right? This is this is not for hosting VMs. This would right. be for use cases like um, you have um, file sharing. You know, uh, yeah, you have Windows Home directories for your VDI deployment or something like that. Uh, for that, it would, uh, would be a perfect use case to serve up uh, through a file service, uh, you know, VM. Right. So the I/O perspective is most most likely coming not just on on the I/O perspective but from the uh, VM is rely on the hardware that supports it. Are you concerned that the VMs that would live on the same boxes that are handling the vSAN? There might be uh, resource contention. Is that yes, your that, okay? That's what okay, let me let me address that because that was a major element in our design. Um, uh, many institutions, and certainly the ones that I work with, are uh, started this way. The uh, storage guys are like, "Oh, you're not going to touch my ops. You know, damn it, that's going to vary." And the the processor guys, oh, "I don't want your disk drives to see it." And there was this kind of a war between the two groups. Um, Ultimately, we found that, and this applies to NSX, which adds the network component onto all the shared hardware. We found that the amount of uh, overhead, if you will, that vSAN required and NSX added was relatively small. It was like 10, 15 percent. More importantly, it didn't vary that much. And when we did testing, all that really meant is that when we were ordering our, in this case, Cisco UCS products, the C-series servers, when we were ordering the product, we just made sure that we had a little blip that said 15 percent, unusable. We have never crossed that boundary. So the advantage here is, is that you should be putting as many of your VMs onto the very hardware that both vSAN and hopefully NSX, if you're using our kind of design, as a matter of fact, correct me if I'm wrong, but your Evo Rail world is just that. Right. In those little boxes, everything exists. So I wouldn't really be concerned that uh, you're going to have uh, contention for overhead. Right. And add another point um, that from our engineering perspective, we actually spend a lot of time to kind of constrain the resources our virtual SAN software uses so that there are enough CPU and memory resources left for the compute VMs. You know, in most of the common use cases, we constrain the vSAN to use 10% or less of the system resources so that 90% can be reserved for the usage by the actual virtual machines and right. what's running those virtual machines. And NSX doesn't add a whole hell of a lot more. Yeah, I understand. Right. Um, so if I understand the, the, the Definition of a hyperconverged um, infrastructure will be based on vSAN and NSX. Is that correct, Tim? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, one point that I don't know if this is important to people out here, but what you just mentioned and sort of its corollary are really at the essential core of the financial argument for doing this. When I was buying, um, let's say, EMC storage, uh, I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with v VMAXs and VNXs and their product line. As you know, it's a stair-step thing. I buy so many disks, then I need a sled, so many sleds, then I need a cabinet, so many cabinets, well, then they come in and sell me a whole truck of new stuff. <laughs> and there are these ups. And then on top of all of that is the uh, maintenance costs. Um, but when I spend all that money, I'm doing nothing for my processing. So then I have that same argument with Cisco on the UCS side. So I need storage. I need pro all of these things are moving in independent costs always up. So now what I'm doing is I'm really saying I'm going to spend X dollars on storage, but I'm going to get for free a certain amount of hosts, 
which, or I'm going to buy a bunch of hosts and get a certain amount of storage for free. I've now taken what were independent costs and put them together into a much more efficient issue. This alone is really the bat, this is where the savings come from with hyperconvergence. It's, it's this elimination of what I'm going to call this previous artificial cost island that, that you've now compressed. One dollar becomes two, two dollars. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I would try to fit in the, in the, in the, in the sense of uh, when you said hyperconvergent infrastructure, so how do I see that in my uh, current infrastructure uh, of IT. Uh, I mean, I, I try to relay that uh, per particular um, new term. Uh, right. Into it's actually extremely simple. So if you have a vSphere cluster, mm -hmm. all you need to do is making sure your hardware is on the vSAN HCL and have the vSAN license and turn on vSAN from vCenter. And that becomes a hyper-converged infrastructure. Oh, so okay. essentially, it turns your vSphere cluster into a hyper-converged cluster that delivers both compute and storage from the same hardware. One of the things you may also find useful is uh, when we did this, uh, and we were assembling the budget for this, um, I had to make representations to upper management that we would do all of this change with no additional dollars. So what's interesting is the money we had bet on storage expansion, processor expansion, and other just junk on a year, I took all those monies out of their little buckets and I put them into a new bucket called the hyperconvergence bucket. The interesting issue is I've never exceeded that. So from a, an objection of I'm not going to do some new technology because it's too expensive, the truth is you can probably do this within your budget. Um, the next piece, though, is uh, a little tougher. Your individuals in your IT department, your storage people, your network people, your, com your compute people, there's a little bit of a religious sort of <laughs> isolation. You know, I don't touch that, I won't do that. You, there's a lot of effort you need to do, and there's a fear of, oh my God, if we compress all these people into a smaller group, my institution's going to let me go. The truth is, that's a real fear, and in, at least in the institutions that, that I've been involved in, the opposite has happened. The IT department's infrastructural group gets smaller. But what happens is those extra people are now put onto projects that are always delayed and in the wings because no one's got any time to spend on it. So there's that added benefit to this too. So if I digest information from you, um, going back to my senior management in indicating... Tell them to call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to make, deliver some sort of statement, right? Yes. So from now on of the infrastructure of the IT perspective, when we're going forward, to utilize the modern technology, technology of the converged, um, hyper-converged infrastructure, basically just ideal shift from traditional sense to a more modern sense of infrastructure where I have everything in the centralized um, mm -hmm. yes. you know, yes. control. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, just a quick question on the kind of business side. What's your uh, go-to market uh, model for uh, EVO, RAC, or SDDC now? Uh, do you have a program planted to qualify a number of uh, joint partners like you did with uh, EvoRail? Sure. So we do have uh, uh, sessions that go into much more details on Evo SDDC. Uh, in short, we'll be working very closely with our hardware partners, and they will be OEMing the uh, Evo SDDC software and deliver uh, their solutions uh, based on Evo SDDC. So it will be slightly different from Evo Rail, but you should go to the Evo SDT sessions to hear all the details about uh, their business model. Yep. Hi. So when a VM and, a, and its virtual disk are not running on the same host, uh, what is the hit on performance like? Uh, actually, I'll go directly to the source, <laughs> have a Christian answer. All right, so, so you asked, you know, if the VM is not running on the same host as, as the data is on, we've actually uh, made, uh, you know, created some white papers to answer exactly that question. And what turns out, and we actually, in our architecture deep dive, uh, you, you should come to that session as well, uh, Chris is hosting that as well. Uh, we go through that, and essentially, if you look at it, the networking overhead that you face compared to realistic storage overheads from storage latencies, the network overhead is so small that the effect is zero. You, uh, like we literally had a really, really hard time measuring any difference between running local and running remote. Now, that's, that's the one side of thing. Now, if you, if you take the other side and say, what if we did locality? What if we tried to optimize this? 
Well, then when the, the emotion happens, which does happen and we, we want it to happen, um, suddenly there you would pay a price. And that is actually very measurable if you, if you look at you know, doing that. So uh, what, we, what we went through in the white paper, and you, you can all read up on it because we got this question a lot, especially last VMworld, and so we sat down, did, it, did the whole thing, and, and um, you know, calculated it and, and measured it, and it's, uh, there's really no impact. N nothing, nothing worth noticeable. Uh, as technology moves on, you know, flash devices are getting better, getting faster, latencies are going down. This question needs to be reevaluated, you know, every once in a while to see if, if it still meets the current technology. And right now, it does. And as technology moves ahead, we and everyone else is reevaluating that question. And, you know, so we might change that in the future if technology changes underneath. But right now, that's the answer. All right. Great. I think our time is up. And really, thank you for being part of the session. Please fill out a survey uh, for our session. And uh, that will be the report card <laughs> for Mike and me. Thank you very much. Excellent.